We welcome you to the lesson today. The title of the sermon, As a Father Does, is based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. If you would, and you would like to follow along, turn in your Bibles, and let's begin our study today. Paul, Savanus, or Silas, and Timothy had preached the gospel, the good news of God at Thessalonica. In writing the letter to the Thessalonians, Paul reminded the brethren, his brothers in Christ, how his fellow workers, such as Silas and Timothy, had behaved while laboring at Thessalonica. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 12, Paul uses the similes in verses 7 and 11, as a nursing mother and as a father. And so he makes a comparison between the mother and the father with Paul and those fellow workers in the gospel. And we'll look more of those later in the lesson today. We'll begin by studying these scriptures from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 in their context. We will then make an application of how fathers as Christians should behave and teach today. We could talk about mothers, but it, for this particular lesson, we'll be focusing on fathers and its application. But as we study the scriptures, we'll be looking at mothers as well. First, in verses 1 through 6, our coming to you. Let's begin by reading the scripture, these scriptures of this passage, and then we'll look at them verse by verse. He said, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after he, we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. And so in verses 1 through 6, we see our coming to you. Paul wrote, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Paul's visit, as well as the visit of his fellow workers to Thessalonica, was not in vain. It was not empty. There were good results from their efforts. The brethren at Thessalonica, in addition to people in other places, witnessed the good results of their labor. The Thessalonians turned from idols to serve the living God. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10, it says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from wrath to come. And so people outside a Thessalonica could testify to the change that they had saw in these brethren. Verse 2, he said, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, and so shortly before coming to Thessalonica, Paul and Silas suffered. You can read about that in Acts 16. And they were spitefully treated at Philippi. In Acts 16, 22 to 23, it says, Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes 
and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And so they suffered at Philippi. They were spitefully treated at Philippi. To treat with spite or malice, ill will. Luke records the history of the event and Paul's testimony of how the magistrates at Philippi treated them with spite. They violated their rights as Roman citizens. In Acts 16, 37, Paul comments, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. They had certain rights as Roman citizens, and their rights were violated. Paul goes on in verse 2, As you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So even after suffering as they did at Philippi, they still came to Thessalonica to preach the gospel of God. They came boldly in order to speak the gospel, despite knowing the conflict or the strong opposition that they would face there. Does this not say something of their sincerity? They came with the intention of serving God, of preaching the gospel of God. He said, as you know, you know this. He said, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Paul, Silas, and Timothy's exhortation to them at Thessalonica was genuine. Their appeal was sincere. There was the need to make the distinction between them and others, as there were others who spoke out of error, uncleanness, or deceit. Paul, who spoke the gospel of God, did not speak out of impure motives or uncleanness, nor did he try to trick or to deceive the Thessalonians, as others might. He simply came to preach the gospel of God, the good news of salvation through Christ. Verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul claimed that they were approved by God. And entrusted with the gospel. Of course, to say that they were approved by God is to imply that the others who perhaps spoke by error or uncleanness or deceit were not approved by God. God entrusted the gospel, his gospel, with them. People such as Paul and Silas and Timothy, the matter of preaching the gospel was a sacred responsibility, which they took very seriously, and so they spoke with the intention of pleasing God, not man, not men, not people, but pleasing God, who knows their hearts. And so they knew that God knew their thoughts and intents, the thoughts and intents of their hearts, and so they came there with the intention of simply serving him and of preaching the gospel of God so that people who believe could be saved. They were not trying to please people, but God in preaching the gospel. If they were just trying to please people, well, of course, they could have omitted things that might have been offensive to some, or they might have included things that were not in the message of God, not in the gospel of God, but yet might have been more palatable to them. 
they were not trying to please people. They sought to please God. And so they preached the gospel of God, the unadulterated gospel of God. It is the gospel that can save. Paul pointed out in Romans 1 that the gospel is the power of God on the salvation to those who believe. But one of a tainted gospel, a perverted gospel. In verse 5, he goes on, he says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Paul testified that they did not at any time use flattering words or praise that they would praise people out of some selfish motives. Of course, the Thessalonians knew that what Paul said, what he wrote was true. They could testify to this fact. Paul also said that they did not use a cloak for covetousness. The word cloak may be translated and is in the New Testament as pretense. They did not use a cloak or pretext for greed. Some people do things out of pretense. This is the professed intention which cloaks the real or genuine intention. It's like wearing a mask to conceal someone's appearance and so the true appearance is under the mask and so paul said that they did not use a cloak or pretext for greed their intention was not of greed when they preached the gospel of god they did so sincerely with the intention of pleasing god they also did not preach out of covetousness or greed, nor did they try to wrongly take advantage of anyone. Paul calls upon God as their witness, saying, God is witness, which is similar to what he said in verse 4, God who tests our hearts. And so Paul makes the argument that God knows his intentions. Now, he put it to the Thessalonians that they could verify that, that he never used flattering words among them. But now as he talks about his intentions, thoughts are in the intentions of his heart, he appeals to God. God knows. God witness. God knows my intentions. He knows why I came here. He knows why I do what I do. And he says it is not out of covetousness. It is not for greed. Paul sincerely commended the brethren for their good example. Back in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 to 10, he did not use flattery. Of course, there's a difference between flattering someone and commending someone. While he commended their work of faith, verse 3, Paul says that he did, he really did not need to say anything at all, as their faith toward God spoke for itself. Their faith toward God, he said, had gone out into the world, and others could speak on this matter. Verse 8. And so, yes, he commended the brethren in the first chapter, but in the second chapter, he pointed out that he did not come with, to them with words of flattery in order to praise them or commend them insincerely in order to gain some advantage to achieve some end. In the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon warned of the harm of flattering with the lips or the mouth. In passages like Proverbs 20, 16, 26, 28, 28, 23, and 29, and verse 5. As you had time, read those, those passages. Paul goes on in verse 6 saying, Nor did we seek glory for men, 
either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So Paul write, writes what he could have done, what they could have done. They did not seek glory from men. They were not looking for praise from people, either from the Thessalonians or from others. This should be true of all disciples of Christ. In Matthew 5, 16, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus points out in the sermon in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 how that there were those who, who fasted and prayed and gave alms in order to have glory from men. But Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, to do these things in order to give glory to God, bring glory to him. They could have, Paul and others could have made demands as apostles of Christ. If necessary, they could have asserted their authority or imposed a burden upon them, gave them something to do or told them what to do. Instead, he said that they were gentle, verse 7. The term apostle is used in two ways. The term apostle means one sent. First, Paul was an apostle in a special way, in that Christ had sent him with authority to preach the gospel. As you study the New Testament, you read the gospel accounts, you, you read of the 12 apostles, the original 12 that the Lord sent out with authority. Later on, we see how that Paul was called to be an apostle of Christ. How that Matthias then replaced Judas, who fell by transgression. But Paul was an apostle in a special way, as was Peter. They were both apostles of Christ. But others could be referred to as apostles in a more general way, as simply someone who was sent to preach. Paul, including Silas and Timothy, could be called apostles in a general sense in that they were sent out as preachers. And so we've seen here the first section in verses 1 to 6, our coming to you. But let's read now verses 7 to 12, our conduct among you. Paul wrote, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And so he addresses our conduct among you in verses 7 to 12. Verse 7, he said, But we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Here's the first of two similes used in this section of Scripture. As a nursing mother. Rather than asserting their authority as apostles of Christ, they were gentle among the Thessalonians. He used the simile of the nursing mother who cherishes her own children to describe their love and their care for the brethren, their brothers and sisters in Christ. They cherished them and they cared for them. They cared, they loved the church like a mother for her own children. Paul was not a mother, but he uses this figure of speech 
making a comparison between a nursing mother and himself and how he treated the brethren with love. And so he says how they cherished and cared for the church at Thessalonica. Verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. They loved the church. They loved the church so much that they were well pleased or delighted to impart or to share with them the gospel, the good news of God. They were also willing to give, if needed, their own lives. They had suffered before coming to Thessalonica at Philippi. And they were ready for what awaited them at Thessalonica. Strong opposition, conflict, verse 2. Why did they come? They cared for them. They longed for them affectionately. They loved them. They had become dear to them. Of course, we read in the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, the congregation there at Thessalonica. And since that time, he says how, how dear they had become to them. Verse 9, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Paul called for the brethren, his brothers and sisters in Christ, to remember how they labored and toiled to support themselves while at Thessalonica. They did whatever they could do so that they could preach the gospel of God, the word of the Lord. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Paul called upon them and God as witnesses of their behavior or conduct. First, he writes how that they behaved themselves devoutly. And so they were devoted and committed to God. They were holy. Second, they behaved justly. They acted in conformity with what was morally upright or good. They themselves were upright or righteous. Third, they behaved blamelessly. They were above reproach and not to be blamed for wrongdoing. They did not flatter, nor were they motivated by greed. They did not seek the glory of men, of people. They came to share, to impart the gospel of God. Verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Here we see the second simile in this section of scripture. As a father. As teachers, they taught the brethren, their brothers and sisters in Christ, as a father would teach his own children. They taught every single one of them. This was personal. First, he says that they exhorted them. The original text deals with calling the one side. At times, Paul and the others exhorted or encouraged them to exhort, to incite to action, or to encourage. Second, they comforted them. And so at times he calmed and consoled them. Think of how hard it must have been 
for the early converts. And third, they charged them. The word may also mean to testify, and it is translated in that way in the scriptures. They did so by appealing to the authority of the Lord, imploring them, urging them to do what was right. Certainly, Paul could do so as a, an apostle of Christ, and the others in a more general sense uh, as preachers in simply preaching the word of God. What did they teach? What did they teach? Verse 12, he said that you walk, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. They were to live in a way that was worthy of God. To do so was to live in a manner fitting or appropriate to the dignity or standard of God. Certainly, they would have recognized that they could not live sinlessly as Christ lived in a sinless manner without sin. But they were to, to live or to walk, to conduct themselves in a way that was pleasing to God. It is God who calls you, he says, into his own kingdom and glory. In one sense, as believers, they were already in the kingdom. Well, we see this in Colossians 1 in verses 13 to 14. Now, let's take a moment and just look at that passage. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, It says, he has conveyed us or delivered us. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so in this sense, they were already in the kingdom of in whom, he says, in Christ, we have redemption through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins. The sinless Christ gave his life on the cross for our sins. And those who had believed and obeyed the gospel were delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of the Father's love. They have the forgiveness of sins. However, there's also the sense, speaking of their reward, the hope of the everlasting kingdom, as we read in 2 Peter 1, 10 to 11, or as it's described by Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 18, as the heavenly kingdom. And so Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, that it is God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And so in one sense, uh, those who were not yet converted, could they could say of them that it is God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And so those who would be converted, these are those who are, who are God calls into his own kingdom and glory. However, if he's speaking in the sense of the hope of the everlasting kingdom or the heavenly kingdom, then he's, he ta he's talking of believers, uh, those faithful to Christ, uh, on to death, Romans 2, Romans 2.10. Uh, those who would receive the inheritance of the heaven, heavenly kingdom or the everlasting kingdom. And so walk in a way worthy of God, live life pleasing to him. Walk in the light as he's in the light, John said in his epistle. Number three, let's close with an application. And today we're going to focus on the simile of the father, the second of these two similes, these two comparisons. As a father, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 10 to 11. 
In these passages, Paul looks at his conduct, how they blame, they behave themselves devoutly and justly and blamelessly. 1 Thessalonians 2.10. He then focuses on his teaching, how they exhorted and comforted and charged every one of them. Verse 11. Paul used the simile, as a father does his own children. What does a father do? A father exhorts. Living as Christians is not always easy. Certainly in the first century, given the persecution that they would face. Not only does a father set a good example for his children in living devoutly, justly, and blamelessly, but he also exhorts or encourages his children. A father may lovingly call his child to his side, urging him to do what is right, whether by reasoning or by his kindly advice or his sincere warning. A father may encourage his children when they are afraid, showing them affection, boosting their confidence. Think how Paul and Silas suffered and were spitefully treated at Philippi. Yet, while being wrongly imprisoned, we see in Acts 16.25 that they were praying and singing hymns to God. Think of all the things that they could have been do doing. They could have been cursing and swearing. But the other prisoners heard them instead praying and singing hymns to God. After getting out of prison, they entered Lydia's house. Uh, a uh, fellow member of the church, someone who had believed and obeyed the gospel earlier in Philippi. Her and her family. And encouraged the brethren before departing. Acts 16.40. Think about that. Here are two people who had been wrongly imprisoned, beaten, their rights violated as Roman citizens. And after getting out of the prison, they go to the house of Lydia and they encourage them. You might think that, well, Lydia would encourage Paul and Silas, but we read in Luke's account how it was Paul and Silas who encouraged the brethren there at Lydia's house. Second, what does a father do? A father comforts. A father may also comfort, comfort his children. He may calm or console them with comforting words, reassuring gestures, or simply by his presence. His child, his daughter, his son may be agitated, upset, and he may comfort her or calm her, or console her. Children may need comfort in times of loss, or when faint-hearted or discouraged themselves. For instance, we see in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 that Paul taught the Thessalonians to comfort the faint-hearted. People who were comforting Mary and her sister Martha in John 11, after the death of her brother Lazarus, there were people who came to them and comforted them, offered words that were comforting to them. John 11, 19 and 31. So again, the same term is used, comfort or comforting. So a father may comfort his child, reassure them. Console them. And number three, a father may charge his child. And so a father may charge his children. What, what do we mean? What did Paul mean, rather, by the word charge? At times, he may charge or appeal to authority to order or to instruct his child, his children, to do what is right. And so there is some in, there is an authority with the word charge. He may charge them or 
used in a different sense in appealing to them and, and urging them to do what is right or not to do what is wrong. For instance, Paul charged that the Thessalonians saying that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory, verse 12. So we see that that's kind of testimony is a charge. And we see this from the next verse in verse 12. Paul charged them saying that they walk worthy of God. What does a father do? As Christians, fathers should set good examples of conduct, their behavior, while teaching their children proper behavior. Fathers should also teach their children that there's life beyond this world that awaits the faithful. Teach your children responsibility, accountability. Paul taught in, in another epistle that we will be judged according to what we have done, whether good or bad. And so be ready. Be prepared in, in this life. What hinders you from being baptized? Paul, after he believed, was baptized in Acts chapter 9. We also read about that in Acts 22 and Acts 26. Or Acts 26. In Acts 22, 16, Ananias told Paul or Saul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What hinders you from being baptized? In Acts chapter 8, 36 to 38, we see an example of conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And we see how that he was told to believe with all his heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Hear the gospel, the good news, the gospel of God, or as it's referred to in other places as the gospel of Christ. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for remission of your sins, Acts 2.38 if you are a Christian, but perhaps you have fallen away, come back to the Lord, repent of your sins, and return to him in prayer. He will forgive. We appreciate you being here today. We hope that this has been helpful, and we would encourage you to seek the Lord in all that you do. Until next time.